Um, hello, everyone. Um, a very, very warm welcome to all of you and a very good evening. Uh, I hope you've settled into your seats. Um, welcome to the British Library this evening for a celebration of Chinatown, one of the events supporting our current exhibition, Chinese and British. It's just down the stairs to the right. I, I hope you've perhaps had a chance to have a look through it. Um, it's free. Please do encourage your friends and families to come. Uh, I'm Lucien Lowe. Uh, I'm a reader at the University of Liverpool um, at the Department of English there and one of the external curators um, of the exhibition Chinese and British. Um, I'll be chairing this evening's event where we'll be exploring four different Chinatowns uh, with our guests this evening, David Yip, Xiao Ma, James Wong and Lisi. Elise Yum, who, and they'll each be speaking about a particular Chinatown. I'd just like to say a, a few words about the exhibition, just to set the context um, a little bit. Um, Chinese and British um, run till the 23rd of April, and it's an exhibition curated by myself, another external curator, Dr. Alex Tekel from the Open University, and a stellar team of internal curators um, from the British Library itself. Um, the exhibition seeks to celebrate over four centuries of Chinese contributions to British society. We all know that the Chinese diaspora and its various communities in the UK is diverse and dispersed. And the British Library, as the nation's library, is the ideal institution in the UK um, to kind of represent Chinese experiences all across the region. So we worked really, really hard with community groups up and down the country to put people, their voices, and the places where they struggled and thrived at the very heart of this exhibition. So apart from books, of course, it's the British Library after all, um, we've got sh personal items, uh, a whole host of interviews, artworks, and they very much convey people's unique and collective voices. So please stop by the exhibition if you can. Um, so once again, a very, very warm welcome to all of you here today. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many of you in person. We'd also like to extend a very special welcome to those of you joining us online. We hope that you enjoy the evening. Welcome also to those of you joining us from across the country via the Living Knowledge Network, the British Library's UK-wide partnership of national and public libraries. We'll be taking questions from our online and in-house audience towards the end of the event. If you're watching online, please submit your questions using the question box below the video. For our audience on site, raise your hand and the microphone will make its way to you. So I'd just like to briefly um, say a little bit about today's event and how it will unfold. Um, and just one more thing, quickly, if you're watching online, you can use the menu above to provide us with feedback on the event, uh, to don donate to the library, uh, and to find out more about our guest speakers. So we're going to begin with very brief presentations from each of our speakers, who, who I'll introduce before they speak. Uh, David will be speaking about Liverpool, James about Birmingham, Xiao Ma about London, and Lisa about Manchester. They'll each be talking about the unique characteristics of the Chinatowns they represent, the particular migrant communities and their experiences, any historically defining moments um, and current challenges faced by these communities today. So the presentations will then be followed by an open discussion between five of us for about half an hour, and then we'll open things up to you, the audience here uh, and online as well. So thanks so much once again for joining us. Um, We'll begin with David um, with a, a very brief talk or presentation, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. Thanks so much. Uh, just to say, you said about eight minutes, so give me a warning, because I'll talk for Britain. I just need a nudge to tell, tell me to start to shut up. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Nice to, nice to see you all here. Um, I'm talking about Liverpool, my hometown, uh, and the Chinatown there. I've got this rather smart-looking cards here because I can talk about Liverpool Chinatown until the cows come home, but I don't know many of the facts and figures. So I've got to thank Walter Fung for some of the wonderful articles he wrote. And today I spent a good couple of hours going through them, going, oh, oh 1907 did that, oh, thing. So I may not use them, I may, but any, I've got to say any quote or any figure I quote tonight is down to Walter, so thank you, Walter. Um, I was born in Liverpool in 1951. Uh, my mum my, my was English, a local girl, and my dad was a, a, a mainland Chinese seaman on the Blue Funnel Line, the Alfred Holt Line. He came over in 1942. Um, that was not unusual. The very fact that the Alfred Holt Company existed, the Blue Funnel Line, the great steam line, uh, had these connections with China and the rest of the world, they brought the Chinese 
from China to the world. They started off from the southern part of China, the, the, the Canton area. And one of the facts I did look at, which I didn't know before, is that basically, take, go 50 miles west of Hong Kong, and you've got this thing they call the four, the four counties. And I, I was fascinated to know this, because and I'm just going to give you the names of these. Yeah, the four counties. And excuse my county, I don't speak Chinese. So forgive, forgive me, but forgive me if I mispronounce these. The four counties were Toisan, Hoping, Sunway, and Yangping. And let's say this is very, it's the very southern Guangdong area, the Canton area. And my dad followed in the, in the footsteps of the historic guys, because the English were not stupid, the British were not stupid. They got these ships going from various places. They had their own offices and like that, but they needed really cheap labor to keep going. And that's where they, they brought in the Chinese. And they knew the Chinese were good workers. So my dad followed in the footsteps of those. And what Chinatowns, as far as I know, and I'm going to talk specifically, but Liverpool is no different from the rest around the world. Chinatowns happened because these guys were on ship. They were given, they were paid reasonably better than they were, would, be, would have been in China, but their conditions were pretty grotty. And when they got to a certain country, the employers were meant to give them accommodation, feed them, and then wait until they got onto their next ship and they were off. But of course, that, those, the best laid plans never worked that way. And what would happen is the guys would be so tired they'd sleep in or they didn't like the food they were getting. So the enterprising ones had made a little restaurant or a little laundry where they could clean their clothes or a place where they could do some gambling or something like that. And that's how Chinatowns basically started from the seamen coming in, needing certain things. Then after many years, maybe one guy would go, actually, you know something, I've had, enough, I've had enough sailing. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to open a little bit of a cafe, but just for the Chinese guys. And so I think the Liverpool one started way, well, way back in, the, in 1907, something like that, but there weren't many people. The big, the big time of Liverpool Chinatown was pre-Second pre, pre World War, and then the Second World War itself, because the, um, my dad came over in 41, he was 16 years old, and he was bought, he was bought uh, a place on, on a blue funnel ship, because uh, he was only 16, and had to get out of Hong Kong as the Japanese were arriving. So he arrived in Liverpool, war-torn Liverpool, and within six months he was on an Atlantic convoy. Uh, I, think he's sorry, I think he was sorry he ever came out, but there you go. Um, and the, the numbers of, of Chinese seamen in Liverpool at that time was about 20,000 because they needed all this, uh, these men and they were constantly on these amazing journeys. Um, and of course, because, the, because also the local, the, the local men were fighting the war, a lot of them had gone to the Far East and they'd learned about Chinese food and things like that. So when the war ended, there was this appetite in this country for the non-Chinese, the, the local people, who some guys quite like Chinese food. Now, to be fair, they didn't. They got they got egg fried rice and something else. It wasn't it, it wasn't the great cuisine that we have. But it was it started off. So Chinatown. Then people realised actually that Chinatowns were viable to other people other than the Chinese themselves. Um, when my dad came over, as I say, he, he came over my, and he met my mum. Now, again, war situation. Most men in Britain, in Britain were, were out fighting the war. They were in uniform, they were in gas. And uh, so there was, a, there was a great shortage of men. And the women were working in factories and things like that. And my mum and her mates used to go to things called tea dances during the day. And the, the, the Rialto Theatre, they used to hold these tea dances in the afternoon. And that's where my mum and many of my, and her mates met Chinese seamen because they were the, they were the guys around. And, and as would happen, nature, you know, things happen, they got together, slowly but surely. Uh, they had eight kids, eventually. Uh, and it may sound very really rosy and everything else, but it, it was not easy for my mum and my dad and having a mixed race family in that time. Uh, Liverpool has always been an amazing place because it is a port. It's used to having foreigners coming in and out. But when you start marrying them and having and kids and all that, and they, they, they got worried. Um, but it, it, it it, it, it is one of the oldest Chinese communities in Europe, it, and it's still very much where it was to start off with. Pitt Street, the original Chinatown, went from Pitt Street right down to the docks, Cleveland Square, literally on the waterfront. And then you came back up, and you hit the thing called St. George's Square, you turned left, and that's Nelson Street. The Germans uh, very 
Kate, Kate during the war blitzed most of Pitt Street. So that disappeared, but they still had Nelson Street, and so it was able to carry on. So that's why, even though London sometimes says they are, we're just as old. No, you, you were, in, you were in, in Limehouse. You moved from Limehouse to, the, to West End. We stayed where we were, and so we've got that. Uh, so there's a great history. There's a great history. They, they are part of Liverpool, yet they are not part of Liverpool. If you go back now, and I was there about a month ago doing a bit of filming, there's a couple of plaques on walls saying it's where the blue funnel ship was, thing, and this is where this is. But it's not, there's not enough to tell you about the real history of the Chinese and the, the contribution they made not only to Liverpool but to this country, both in the war but also after with businesses and everything else. And that's partly down to, to the government as they are but also to our own, our own mindset in a way. The Chinese communities are very hard working but they wanted their children, like my father, he had eight children, and he wanted his children not to work on ships, he wanted them to have education and do this and that and the other, and that's true. But we, we, we lost out a little bit, um, although we're getting there with younger generations, to have a social context. David. One of the questions that was asked in, to say about our communities, how they differ. Um, after the war, or during the war, the Chinese seemed like they were on the Atlantic convoys, but the difference was with the, with the, with the uh, white guys, they were paid about a quarter of their salary, and they were not given what was called a war bonus, which meant because your life is in danger, you got this bonus. So in 1942, uh, the seamen, the Chinese seamen went on strike. And there's no doubt about it, historically, it was the Shanghai Communist Party who had peep guys in, in Liverpool who actually got the guys to say, come on guys, we've got to, we've got to stop this. And they did, and they, they won a small battle. They won, they did, they didn't get this parity of, of wages, but they got, they got a rise in the pay, and they got the war bonus. Uh, the war ended, and in 1946, I'm sad to say, it was the Labour government under Attlee and the trade unions movement in Liverpool, which is, you know, Liverpool is, is, is a red-hot union country. But they turned around and said, you know, we're worried about these Chinese guys in Liverpool. And also the government said, we're worried about the guys who founded the strike. We, you know, we've got the communist connection. And in 1946, they decided that there had to be a forced repatriation of the Shanghai seamen. And we're talking up to 1,300 people or more. And literally, uh, literally overnight, they, they had this plan. They had, they had some ships in, in the Mersey, and they either grabbed seamen, they either told seamen they had to report to this ship, or they literally grabbed them off the streets. Um, and the, Avon Foley, who is a wonderful academic, uh, her mother was married to a, a Shanghai seaman. She was pregnant with, with, with uh, Yvonne. Yvonne never knew her father, as far as I remember. But her father went out one day and never came back. And as far as her mother was concerned, this man had deserted her. And she, like many other wives, uh, believed that. And she never knew what had happened to her. And, so, and Yvonne did not know that she had a Chinese father until many years later when she was informed. Uh, also, just a small fact, that when a, a, a local woman married a Chinese, she lost her British citizenship. She became an alien. So a lot of these women whose, whose husband had suddenly disappeared, their breadwinner had gone. They were not allowed any, any uh, there wasn't much social service, but there weren't allowed anything because they were not, they were not classed as British citizens. So it, it, was, it, it was a ter terrible scar, on, uh, on, not only on, uh, on the government, but also on this country. And it, was, and it was Yvonne in 2006, I believe, after a long fought battle. Once she, once she found out about her father, and being the academic she is, she, she has not stopped. There's a, she's got a wonderful website, um, and she finally got a plaque put up at the pier head acknowledging these guys. And the government of this country have not done an official apology, but there has been an acknowledgement. David. Yep. Um, I'm thank, gonna thank shut you up. So, yeah, thank oh, well, you so I'll much. shut up now. Okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> but Yvonne, you know, um, is. Yvonne's interview is in the exhibition, so I'm so glad you got to, got to introduce her and, and her experiences as well. Uh, thank you so much for that, David. Um, kind of wonderfully evocative beginning and also just that, that historically defining year in 1946 when the, the Chinese sailors were repatriated. So thank you so much for that. Um, and next we have Xiao Ma uh, speaking about um, London's Chinatown. Thank you so much, Xiao Ma. Thank you. I have some slides to help me with the story. 
there you go. Um, so um, my name is Xiao. I'm the first generation immigrant. I have been calling London my home for 10 years. So it's really my honor to come here today to uh, tell you a little bit more about our Chinatown. Um, I'm wearing two hats to tonight to tell you a little bit more about Chinatown. I'm, I work for a charity called China Exchange, which is based in London's Chinatown. And I co-produced several heritage-making projects in Chinatown to uh, encourage people to learn more about uh, our Chinatown's history. And I'm also doing a research about Chinatown, more focused on its cultural complexity as a doctoral researcher. So um, today, I actually, before I tell a little bit more about Chinatown, I want to say something. I think like any place, our Chinatown is also associated, associated with very diverse lived experience and conflictive views. And I think it's impossible for one person to speak for our Chinatown. And I'm not going to try to do that tonight. Instead, I'm going to invite you to explore this neighborhood with me through from the perspective of its cultural representation. So our Chinatown is located in southern part of Soho. Have you been to London's Chinatown? Put your hands up if you have been to. Wonderful. Everyone has been to Chinatown. So, um, so this is a very dyna dynamic commercial center that welcomes over 50 million visitors from all over the world every year. Um, and this is very vibrant. And the London Chinese, cel uh, Chinese New Year celebration, also known as a Lunar New Year celebration, uh, organized by our London Chinatown Chinese Association, is, uh, has been described as the um, largest celebration outside Asia by Visit London. Um, Soho, this place, has always been a center for immigrant life since the 19th century. For example, at the beginning of the 20th century, Soho has already been a residential and a business home for many French, German, Polish, uh, Italian, Londoners. And it was since the 1950s, a southern part of Soho saw a steady increase of uh, restaurant businesses opened by immigrants from the new territories of Hong Kong. And they were attracted to this area because it's affordable commercial rent. And since the 50s, this area has been a home for many migrant pioneers of diverse background who created the original Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club, the first Pizza Express restaurant, the first Chinese printing shop, and the first supermarket that imported Pai Cho into the UK. There are so many examples, I don't have time to tell you all. Um, so, but when, why, and how would this part of Soho transformed into a Chinatown? Well, I need to take you back to the 1980s, oh, I don't see the title. The title says the making of Chinatown from the 50s to present. Um, so London's Chinatown as both an uh, urban concept and a reality was socially produced by both Chinese people and non-Chinese people. Um, and uh, what happened is at the beginning of the 1980s, uh, Jera Street and its surrounding area already had more than 40 businesses opened by people of Chinese heritage from very diverse geographical locations, including Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, etc. But that area was not exclusively Chinese. So in 1985, that area was officially designated as a Chinatown by Westminster City Council. So this was a result of a direct collaboration between the council and the local Chinese business leaders. Um, and the aim, the main aim was to attract tourists. Both sides conceived the idea of Chinatown as a place of ethnic difference. And uh, the idea of celebration of a difference was used as a tool for urban regeneration. And the actions were taken and the money was invested to, to turn this area into a Chinatown, to make it look like Chinatown by exoticizing and self exoticizing its space. Um, but who actually had the power to define Chinatown at that time? I'll give you an example. Here you can see a photo of the iconic uh, welcome gate on Jera Street. Many visitors today assume that these gates were created by Chinese people but actually they were not. Um, although Chinese business leaders um, proposed the idea to the council to build the gate in Chinatown, um, but they were not included in the final designing process. Instead, 
um, those gates were created as Western interpretation of Chinese style of Paifang gates. And they have been standing in our Chinatown for almost 40 years. Um, so people have very different views about the institutionalization of Chinatown in London in the 80s. Um, definitely, this transformation has brought economic benefits to the local businesses, including Chinese businesses. And some people also think that, that was a sign that Chinese people were recognized in London. Um, but at the same time, some people think, you know, actually this kind of Chinatown symbolism created very narrow images of Chinese-ness and reinforced uh, stereotype. And some scholars also argue that this transformation was based on a very problematic understanding of Chinese ethnicity and culture, which see them as fixed entity, and it doesn't directly promote racial equality. Well, different people have different views, but what we can be sure is that this kind of representation of Chinese people and the Chinese culture has had a very long-term impact. Well, in the past 20 years, our Chinatown has seen significant changes. Many historical um, Cantonese family-run uh, restaurants have closed down, while many new businesses founded by investors have uh, have come in and introduced, uh, introducing new trends to this area. And um, we also saw we also saw an increase of mainland Chinese people working in this area. Um, our Chinatown is very it's very diverse, it's associated with multiple associated with multiple stakeholders, communities, but in media representation, this area is still often be described as the Chinatown community. Well, I'm gonna show some statistics about Chinatown. Let's see whether you agree. So the, one of the most distinctive uh, characteristics of London Chinatown is that our Chinatown is a primarily commercial district. Um, majority of the property are owned by Shaftesbury PLC, and this is the area heavily relies on visitors of all backgrounds. They are about 150 businesses operating this area in terms of the brand positioning uh, created by businesses themselves. Around 70% of them are Chinese, the, the remaining 30% of them are other East Asian, Southeast Asian, or European. Um, workers in Chinatown are culturally and linguistically extremely diverse. Um, major although majority of the workers in Chinatown are ethnically Chinese, but they have cultural ties to many places in East Southeast Asia, the Caribbean, and India. And also there are a great number of people of European heritage and South Asian heritage working in our Chinatown. They are also part of our Chinatown. Um, Another hidden aspect of London Chinatown is that there are actually four community organizations operating in this area. I have the logos here. Um, they are providing very important services to different people. As you can see, our Chinatown is associated with multiple communities, different interest groups. And it's also a, it's not an enclosed place. It's a, vibrant commercial district that is open for people to come to work and visit. To me, in Chinatown, uh, um, border crossing or intercultural exchanges are part of people's everyday encounter. But many people still imagine our Chinatown as a bounded urban container of a Chinese community. This brings me to the next slides about uh, the challenges facing our Chinatown. The COVID-19 pandemic crisis and the COVID-related prejudice and the racism have had a very huge impact on these communities. Um, since the first case was reported in China, our businesses in Chinatown saw a dramatic drop in footfall. My office is based in Chinatown. I saw the huge contrast between Chinatown at, and its surrounding areas, for example, Covent Garden, Leicester Square. It feels like people were just avoiding Chinatown. It seems like some people think Chinatown was just somehow so essentially different that it is more dangerous than other places in central London. And in some people's mind, they kind of see Chinatown as a racialized Chinese space. Um, this really made us to rethink, how should we talk about the difference? How should we talk about difference in a nuanced way without reinforcing imagined ethnic boundaries and without dividing people, without segregating people? 
Our business in Chinatown faced the challenges, for many challenges. For example, the vulnerability of a visitor economy, the rising operating costs, the lack of skilled chefs and workers. The COVID-19 crisis has just made the situation way worse. Um, there are also other challenges um, facing our Ch London Chinatown uh, as a whole. For example, um, racism has been a historical challenge for many racially minoritized workers and the visitors in Chinatown. And also there's also a lack of community building and the plural voices representing Chinatown. Currently there's only one community group and one organization they are acting as the official voice for Chinatown, but our Chinatown is associated with multiple interest groups. Um, as heritage practitioners, we also face a challenge that is how can we bring together different voices, different groups, different people to to explore, the, to explore Chinatown in a more nuanced way, to encourage a more nuanced understanding of our Chinatown. I'm afraid that actually we found more questions than answers, and I'm going to propose two questions for us together to reflect on today. The first question is, should we reclaim Chinatown in relation to the cultural representation of Chinese and East and Southeast Asian people in the UK? Why and how? Second question is, how do we represent Chinatown as a space for everyone without neglecting the racial inequality and the social injustice faced by people of Chinese and East and Southeast Asian ethnicities in the UK? Thank you. Thank you so much, Xiao. Um, I really like the fact that you underscored the, the need to kind of challenge essentialist images of Chinatown, which is something uh, the exhibition also very much tries to do um, through not only highlighting obviously the history of early industries the Chinese were committed to laundries and seafaring and and so on but also to you know to highlight that Ch the Chinese have contributed across science technology sport fashion and across all forms of uh, artistic expression as well so so that, that's really really key um, I think that Chinatown is not just associated with you know, the restaurant and catering trade, that is, it's so much more than that. So thank you so much for that. Um, and then our next speaker is James Wong, who's been talking about um, Birmingham's Chinatown. Um, does it work? Ooh. Oh, sorry. Thank you, I James. have to go back. You've seen all my slides now. <laughs> Hello, my name is James Wong. I am the MD of uh, Chongying Restaurant Group. And also, I arrange Chinese New Year. I was the Southside bid chair uh, a couple of years ago, so that encompasses the whole of Chinatown and the gay quarters and theatre land in Birmingham. I'm also the patron of the Chinese Community Centre and the governor of a school. So I do a lot of things with Chinatown. So when they came and gave me an opportunity to talk about Chinatown, well, obviously I jumped at the opportunity to come over and thank you everyone for coming over. So this year, this is some of my highlights this year. I know it's a bit of a self-promotion, but hey, here we go. It's going down to the internet, why not? So this year, I was uh, I carried the Commonwealth Torch, which I was very proud. We won two awards in uh, the Million Food and Drinks Award, which is a local award. We went down to London and to uh, the Golden Chopsticks Award a couple of months ago and picked up the uh, Dumpling of Year Award. And I was made an honorary doctorate at Aston University. Now, all these things seem to be like blowing myself, blowing my own trumpet, but it's not. I'm trying to encourage the younger generation. If I, a second generation Chinese, can achieve all this, everyone else can. And for too long, I think the second generation, third generation, has been hidden themselves. And it's a conversation I have quite often to say, why? Why, is our, uh, we, why are we so underrepresented? Why is there no Chinese MP? Well, I think it's one Chinese MP, a handful of councillors. Why are we not in position of power? And when you see, we have now got an Asian Prime Minister. So we've got to think, and how can we uh, push out forward to people? You know, we break the boundaries. Do I class myself as one of us or one of them? Because I don't. I don't see colour ever to see it to be an issue. I feel I'm one of the persons Grown up in England, I'm, I'm, I support England in the football, in the World Cups. So I'm, wish, I'm missing the World Cup to come here, so which is fantastic to see you guys, and which you guys are as well. So I'm just kind of thinking, it's like, you know, obviously I want to talk about Birmingham Chinatown, and, you know, I can, we cannot compare to Manchester, Liverpool, or 
or London, where they have got much bigger Chinese population, much greater heritage, much greater history. Birmingham are, have one of the smallest Chinatown. And you know, it's not something we, we, we're going to uh, not, not address about. But I could say it's the only Chinatown that can grow. How can it grow? These are all the plans going ahead with Smithfield site, where you've got acres of site, just literally down the road from where Chinatown is, which is going to be uh, sooner going to be encompassed the south side bit. So you're talking literally 3,000 new homes and even an area for performance for 3,000 people with a lot of different uh, businesses, offices, and uh, residential living, a lot of green spaces. You've seen the towers just, uh, just by the wing ringway, five towers, that's all kind of in planning building. So it's the only Chinatown that's actually building because we can build south towards Birmingham where Dick Birth and all the area regeneration and I, I believe in time, 20, 30 years time, it will be the Chinatown of the future. And when you look at Liverpool, when you look at trying to move into somewhere else, Manchester, you know it, you're encompassed because I studied in Manchester for, uh, for, for three years. And when you look at, oh, sorry, and, and, and London, Obviously, it's, you know, nobody can compare to London Chinatown with the visitors and heritage and everything else. But if you look to the future, people are coming to Birmingham. And why are people coming to Birmingham? Affordability. It's plain and simple, affordability. Flats, accommodation, everything else is so much cheaper than everywhere else, like Manchester and London. Not quite sure about Liverpool, so David, I can't compare with statistics. But if Wing Yip, as we were talking earlier, can set his headquarters in Birmingham back in 1970s, as Wing used to say to me, people don't talk about distances, they talk about time. How far is it to go to each destination? So in Birmingham, it takes two hours to go to London, one half hour to go to Manchester, one, one half hour to go to Liverpool. We are in the centre of everything, so the, uh, the chance to grow is so much more. So we, the Chinatown is in the, within the close proximity of the city centre, and at the moment, we have got a, a growth plan, which is the whole city centre area. It's going to be, I think, not going to be very car friendly, but encourages people to come into the city and actually live. And you see at this moment in time, explosion, the Hong Kong BNO is coming over. I, I'm sure it's exactly the same with every other city that you have. But we, we, we see a lot of it, and people come into Birmingham. Why do they come in? Because there's, there's opportunity. There's opportunity. They could buy a house. You could buy, uh, you know, buy a house, 250, 300,000 pounds. You could buy an apartment for 200, 200,000, 200,000, 250,000 pounds. So you think about all of that. And also, we've got great university networks all around the area. So, you know, we feel like, you know, uh, uh, we're going to be attracting a lot of uh, investments. We also got a lot of uh, Section 116 money, which are the funds that's going towards making public highway, public arts. We have not got a Chinatown art yet. It's something that we could push it forward in time. I'm, I'm head of the London Chinatown project as well, so hopefully we will deliver Arch sooner or later, but uh, it's one of the dreams that we all wanted to have. That's the uniqueness of Birmingham. We talk about the, the migrant routes. I think it's very similar to David, you just uh, touched about it, you know, I, I think it's all the cities, but obviously uh, I think Liverpool is about 1911 or something like that in the ports. But uh, Birmingham, I think the first kind of um, Recorded history is probably about 1950s, you know, when you've got a lot of Hong Kong people, it's about Hakka, Hakka communities, and also a lot of Vietnamese boat people came as well. Uh, they, they, uh, we call it Yut Lang Wa Kiu, you know, they speak Chinese and Vietnamese. So we, we got a huge population that in, 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 in Birmingham. 1980s, we saw a lot of predominantly Hong Kong people coming over. My mom was one of those people that came over. And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, well, actually, no, my mom came in the 70s, but uh, there's a lot of people came over, over that side. 2005 is when I saw the, the switch, because I don't speak Mandarin. And then all of a sudden, lots of Chinese people coming into the restaurant to eat, and there was a lot of migrants, and especially Fujian province. And then we noticed that, and then I think 2008 is when I first noticed a lot of university people coming over, and then, you know, our, our restaurant wasn't catered to looking after Mandarin mainland speakers because nobody spoke Mandarin in my restaurant. <laughs> so people coming to my restaurant, we couldn't cater for them. So then from 2008 onwards, every new uh, front house has to speak Mandarin. I, I'm the only one in my restaurant that don't speak Mandarin. So, you know, so I'd always said I have to learn, but it's, it's just one of those things. Right? But, uh, you know, so now, you know, 2022, Hong Kong, BNO, absolute influx in 
thousands and thousands of them. They're all going towards the affluent areas, the solid hole where HS2 is going to come up, uh, come past, Sutton Coalfield, which is a very nice uh, area. But we also see in inner, inner suburbs as well, the mostly uh, the Edgebaston and the Harbons, and we are where the more affluent people will find, but where there's a lot of great schools. But we, we noticed there's a place in Northfield and Longbridge, it seems to be a huge amount of influence of change because of affordability of uh, people coming over. We talk about <laughs> historic defining moments, mm -hmm. and it, it's something that uh, Chung Ying, my restaurant, my, my parents. So my parents opened Chung Ying in 1981. So why ha is it historic? Because back then in Chinatown, there's nothing. There's, there's sporadic. I think back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, it's more in Spark Hill area, so it's more in the suburb. And then in the 70s, they decided to mo move towards the B5 area, so where China outskirts and where Chinatown is. Bromsko Street, there's, there was a, the Chinese Community Center. Oh, is it not this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll get into that later. So uh, when Chung Ying came in 1981, it's because on the back of the Hippodrome Theatre, our national theatre, where we had, it's the biggest theatre in the country, had a uh, major refurbishment. And then my father uh, from, uh, came in from London, Man my mother came in from Manchester, met in the Midlands, oh. and then uh, next thing uh, they got together, and then next thing was uh, Chung Ying. And a lot of people are asking me, Chung Ying, it's a, you know, if you're Chinese, you understand what Chung Ying means? <laughs> China, England? But it's actually my dad, my dad's called Chung, and my mom's called Ying. <laughs> so that's why it's called Chung Ying. And a lot of people didn't know that. And I, I tell people that's uh, about this story. So 1981, when Chung Ying was open, there was no Chinese restaurant all around that area. And then next thing is the explosion of different restaurants. So all around there was just warehouses, disused warehouse. There's actually a bomb site. So where you see Arcadian, where you do the Chinese New Year celebration, it was a bomb site. There's nobody there. So it was, our, our, our restaurant was a, a shoe factory. Then it was a synagogue before that. So, you know, all that area. So the explosion from growth of the catalyst in the middle is all from Chung Ying. And then as it spread around, uh, it was far out wide. Now, as I said, it's just absolutely grown strong. Every new unit is now being taken over by Chinese people straight away, buying it out. Actually, the gay community, which is next door to it, is slowly, slowly being forcing out, so forced out. So we talk about challenges. I think one of the, one of the uh, uh, things that I'm talking about, uh, challenges, historic and current. And I, I don't want to go down the racism route. I, I think it's, uh, it's one of the things, it's, it's a touchy subject, I think. I think we don't have that much in Birmingham, because I feel like we are a very diverse city. We've got a, a lot of different multicultural people. I think growing up nowadays, it seems to be everyone's growing up in a multicultural race. And I don't think it's such a big problem in Birmingham. I, I'd rather look at the business, it's, uh, you know, because obviously I'm a businessman. Uh, I feel the energy crisis is a, a big problem. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the supply issues, it's mm -hmm. always a massive issue, you know, problem. Employment, employment shortage. Mm -hmm. I think every Chinese restaurant is going through like trying to grab each other's staff just to try, try and get to, just so every place is, uh, is having problems. Are there traffic issues? All the city centre is going green. Nobody wants cars to be driven in parking, everything else is going to be a, a problem. Another problem I face is, uh, I, look, I, I see is actually people, our own people, segregation, mm -hmm. Chinese people. You only go with Chinese people. You don't mingle, you don't integrate. This is always a problem. So now it's not just that, not the Chinese integration, the Chinese subsection integration. So you've got the China Chinese with one lot, the Hong Kong, the, uh, Hong Kong people coming out and also the what we call the uh, uh, BBC, the British Born Chinese, is a separate group. And now the Hong Kong BNO is a separate group. We're all Chinese, and at the moment, nobody's mixing with each other. And it seems to be all separating. And I, I'm not, I, I won't be able to solve this uh, <laughs> question, uh, this uh, dilemma. But it's something that I do see that, uh, you know, when I try to go into each different section, it seems there's a reluctancy to try and you know, to integrate, to actually find out, to, it's even like you're going over to say hello. You know, after a while, you see certain just migrate back to their own side. So when I studied in Manchester, I, I made, made sure that I didn't join in any Chinese organizations because I don't want to be just mixed. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm racist to my own kind. Maybe, maybe it's, just a, it's just quite funny. So that, this is the thing, the support, maybe what we can do, I don't know, it's language, maybe it's a language barrier, maybe there's a cultural barrier. But I think it's like, at the moment, England, 
we, well, in Britain, we, 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 I think British people love Chinese. And how could we integrate more? So in, in, through my Chinese uh, U.S. federations, I was talking to you earlier about what we do. So instead of just doing, I know, I know Manchester and, Liverpool, um, and, and, and London and Liverpool have big Chinese federation in Chinatown. I do it differently. I do Chinese New Year celebration at multi locations. So I did it at, so we do it at uh, Boring, we do it at uh, uh, Chinatown, and also we visit schools. And this is a very integral thing. If you're able to introduce Chinese culture to children at a young age, I think this will eliminate what a big, big problem that we have. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad you kind of followed on um, from um, Sal, Sal's point about the, the kind of anti-essentialist um, image of, of Chinatown that's, that we necessarily need to discuss, that, that's not just a homogenous Chineseness, um, and that, that, that different waves of migration which present different problems and challenges and, and obviously, obviously opportunities as well. So thank you so much for that. And our, our final speaker, um, is Lisa um, from Manchester, and she'll be discussing Manchester's Chinatown with us for a little bit. Yeah. Thanks so much, Lisa. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Yam. I'm from Manchester. I'm here today to talk about Chinatown, not football. So, Manchester Chinatown is the second largest Chinatown in the UK and the third largest in Europe. The first Chinese settlers arrived in Manchester in the earlier days of the 20th century, choosing Manchester as an alternative location to Liverpool, where a Chinese community had already settled and was beginning to grow. Many arrived alone and were engaged in the traditional trade of laundries, but it wasn't until the 1940s that larger numbers arrived in, and in 1948, the first Chinese restaurant in Manchester, the Ping Hong on Morsley Street, open. Over the following decades or so, another 16 restaurants were established. The first significant wave of Chinese immigration ranked through the 1940s and into the 1950s following the Second World War. During the, this time, Chinese restaurants again multiplied in numbers and by the 1970s, other Chinese businesses had opened, including the medicines shop, supermarkets, and finance and legal services. Today, Manchester Chinatown is centered around the impressive Ming Dynasty styled Imperial Arch, which was dedicated in 1987 with many shops and restaurants seats around Nicholas Street, Faulkner Street, and George Street. At the time of its completion in 1987, the Arch was the largest in UK, but was uh, subsequently overtaken by Liverpool, <laughs> <laughs> Chinatown's archway in 2000. Manchester Chinatown is perhaps unique in not having only an arch, but also two pagodas and a significant Chinese-style street de uh, decoration. In recent years, however, we suffer from a problem with antisocial behavior perpetrated by the individuals from outside the community. Indeed, earlier this year, the pagoda was severely damaged and nearly destroyed. When it was attacked by a young man who is known to be a troublemaker in the city. Manchester Chinatown is a living Chinatown where people work and run their businesses. Although it is a major tourist attraction, there are very few souvenir shops or stores trying to sell to tourists the typical touristy t-shirt and fridge magnets. <laughs> Maybe because of this, it is an authentic feel that attracts tourists. You can always see tourists storing in Chinatown and, also, and almost everyone stops 
by the archway to take a few photos. The area continued to grow and developed throughout the 1990s and early 2000 with a further influx of migrants from Hong Kong around the time of the handover of Hong Kong to China in 1997. After this period, we also saw a significant number of migrants arriving from mainland China. Generally, these people arrived in one of two ways, either as business investor or by initially coming to the city as students and choosing to remain and make the city their home. The second of these routes have probably proven to be most significant as local universities have in recent years played host to many thousands of students from China. Manchester is a home to two significant and large university, Manchester University and Manchester Metropolitan University. And along with Salford University, which is also located very close by, these universities have achieved, has actively encouraged students from China and have undertaken marketing campaigns designed at promoting their courses on the Chinese mainland. This group has served to deepen trade link with China and this has led to a larger number of Chinese-owned logistics and trading companies being established in the city. Whilst most of these companies are located outside of Chinatown, their influence is still felt, for example, in the membership of local Chinese community groups based in Chinatown, where the numbers of Mandarin speakers are now significant. We are currently seeing the third significant wave of the immigration from Hong Kong and many thousands of people arriving over the last few years. Manchester has proven to be a particularly popular destination for this latest group of arrivals as it has viewed as significantly cheaper than London whilst still offering the benefits of a large existing Chinese population and the many other benefits of a large city. The most recent immigration has led to the local Chinese population increasingly increasing significantly over the period, but has also led to tensions developing. Manchester Chinese community has long enjoyed a close and friendly relationship with the Consulate of People's Republic of China when it's located in the city. The Consulate has always, for example, been supportive of the local community associations that arrange celebrations of major Chinese festivals, such as Chinese New Year, and offers assistance by, for example, providing materials and costumes. They also provide a large quantity of PPE and other medical supplies when the COVID pandemic was impacting the city. As a result, a significant number of the most recent arrivals, especially those that are active in the Hong Kong independence movement, have been quick to label local Chinese people pro-China and have made an active effort not to integrate into the existing society. This is unfortunate as the different Chinese ethnic groups in Manchester have long enjoyed a harmonious and peaceful relationships, has experienced none of the tensions which have been present in Hong Kong in recent times. Coupled with this, I think that it's fair to say that Chinatown in recent years has played a less significant role within the Chinese community. Many Chinese businesses now choose to locate outside Chinatown and the community no longer feels it's necessary to limit themselves to this small part of city. Many second and third generation Chinese have less of connections of their Chinese heritage than their parents did and even recent arrive, arrivals feel confidence enough to set their sights wider. This hasn't been the help 
by the difficulty in obtaining commercial space within Chinatown itself with a large number of properties in the ownership of a small number of people who seem to have little intention of using or developing themselves. We have also seen a significant trend towards once entirely commercial properties being in part converted to residential units. I think that this is a significant change and we and will hope, hopefully breathe new life into the area provide. We just have to hope that the retentions of the commercial units to the lower floors of these buildings will enable the area to retain its unique Chinese characteristics, whilst the Chinese community in Manchester as a whole continue to grow and develop in significance. And I have no doubt that it will continue to do. It is likely that Chinatown itself has challenges ahead if it is to maintain its role and important with the community. The community in Chinatown is strong, and so I feel confident that it will face these challenges. Thanks for listening to me today. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, we'll now have about 15 minutes where I, I'm hoping that you know the five of us could could have a, a conversation about um, what you've discussed. There's so much um, actually um, that spans all four of um, the, t the, the, the brief presentations today. And I was wondering perhaps if we could pick up on you know, David's phrase um, about being part of Liverpool and not part of Liverpool, um, and kind of thinking through the way in which the Chinese communities in these different Chinatowns feel part of their cities and not part of their cities, but more expansively, perhaps part of British society and not part of British society, and to the extent to which they perhaps want to be m more part of the city, um, but are, f are facing barriers to do so. Um, perhaps we could go back to, to David, who we haven't heard from in a little while. I think, um, just, uh, historically, when the first Chinese came over and started businesses, of course, they didn't know the culture they were sitting in. And there was quite right, well, not quite right, but there was a reaction to them. And it was quite racist. And so they, they kept very quiet and kept to themselves. But, but the, the thing that struck me was what James said about the community in Birmingham, how, in actual fact, if you're not careful, uh, you can have a Chinese element which goes, well, we must be careful about not going outside. But then even within that, you get the Mandarin speakers or the Southern speakers or the, the Hong Kong speakers, thing like that. And if you're not careful, you, it's, it becomes more difficult to go outside of yourselves. And in actual fact, it's a generation thing. Because when I first, um, as an adult, went back to Liverpool Chinatown and I was speaking to like, uh, James's father's generation, they, they, their, their vision was very narrow. It was, they had a vision, but they wanted to make money. They wanted to do well, and they wanted their children to have education and to do something really different, become doctors and things like that. But of course, that's great, but it, they, did, they had no real social conscience. And that's what James said again. And to me, when I look at the, the younger people, my, and my grandchildren, what all the Liverpool Chinese, or what all the Chinatowns and what the Chinese people in this country have to achieve is more of a social conscience as well. We are gonna achieve all those other things anyway. We could do that in our sleep, but it's the other things. And, and I'm, I'm a non-Chinese speaker, and it's, and it's understanding that I, I'm very excited the fact that in this country today, we have many problems, but one of the things we do have, if you really want to, we have a wonderful cultural diversity, and it's only gonna grow because the younger people, they don't want to separate in the way that they go. And, and that's, that's how I see Chinatowns growing, or ch not Chinatown, but, but ch the Chinese communities. Great, thank you so much, uh, David. Xiao, um, James, and Lisa, what are your thoughts about, um, yes, the extent to which the Chinese communities you work with feel part mm. of the city and not part of the city, mm. um, and maybe part of Britain and not part of Britain? Um, I don't mind to go first. So if I may just use the creation of Chinatown as an example to um, address what you just shared, this kind of um, included exclusion. 
So a lot of people say the creation of Chinatown is a form of included exclusion. It sounds inclusive. It sounds like we're celebrating ethnic difference, but actually what it does, it does not directly promote racial equality. It's missing out the point that Chinese people are people too. So some people also argue Chinatown, this idea, this urban concept of Chinatown itself actually minoritized Chinese people, mm. tying Chinese people with a specific place. But the thing is, in fact, people of Chinese heritage are di have been diversified in all aspects of UK life. People work in all sorts of you know, fields, and not only in restaurant uh, catering industry but uh, the cultural representation of Chinese people are still kind of very closely associated with the catering industry. Not saying it's not, not right. Of course, you know, our early Chinese immigrants has really established themselves in this catering industry, um, provided for the next generation for better life. But it's kind of this over-representation. It's a form of included exclusion. And if we talk about people of Chinese heritage as a whole, um, I think, if I may just dwell on cultural representation, a lot of people I interviewed and uh, we together as a charity we interviewed, we feel like a lot of people are saying, um, particularly the second generation, they were saying they found like the differences between ethnic minority and the ethnic majority has become what defines ethnic minority. So in this way, we were not uh, so in, it's kind of very, in a very narrow way, our culture has been defined. So I think what is important is to really emphasize in individual agency to craft our own understanding of our history and what we want to be, how we want to be represented in this country. Yeah. Great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, James, could we have a few thoughts from you about this question about, about Birmingham? I think... Um there's a lot of people in the second generation nowadays, especially my, my, my friends and things like that, they don't really care about, you know, Chinese heritage or even speaking Chinese. Because all my friends don't even speak Chinese to each other. We all speak English. You know, what do we do? We go to the pub, go to the club, and actually integrate in non-Chinese activities. It's almost we are now westernized, if you say so, 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 so to speak. I'm the, one of the few people that kind of think, oh, you know, we've got to embrace our Chinese heritage, and it's very important to teach our second generation. Um, you, you fall into this category where probably like, say, look at America, where you've got like fifth and sixth generation Vietnamese and Chinese don't actually believe they're Vietnamese or believe they're Chinese, because you know, you're only for the color of your skin that you are that race. But when you also think about the whole diversity of different people that come over, when you talk about different sort of so white people, Europeans and things like that, they get segregated when you talk about Irish people coming over back in the 70s or uh, 1800s or whatever it is. You know, when people coming over, it's exactly the same. It's only the fact that at the moment we think it's the color of our skin and we think we are of that heritage. But I believe in the future, this won't happen. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm positive. I'm positive about this, but not to say that we should not forget about our heritage. And this is where I come in, trying to do a lot of things to say, right, okay, well, you should be proud of your heritage. But actually, I see non-Chinese people coming up to me that knows far more Chinese heritage than me. They're actually more Chinese than me. They're speaking much better in Cantonese and Mandarin than I could ever do. And whereby, like my, my child, my son, five years old, fluent in English, doesn't speak a word Chinese. <laughs> you know, but it's, maybe it's just the fact that I think, you know, it's, it's, it's important at that stage. So the second generation, the first generation, sometimes they feel that's maybe not so important as education. I think some of you touch on education, finding business. You know, everyone wants to make sure they go to a good school or make sure they have a good understanding, uh, upbringing, be polite and everything, work hard. You know, you know uh, parents, everyone say, oh, be a doctor, be an accountant, be a solicitor. And that we all falls into that back, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that kind of category. But then, you know, I'm, I'm one of these guys that come out and say, you know what, I don't really want to study. Uh, Dad, I want to help you in the restaurant. Dad, I want to understand and take some burden out of you. Dad, I want to, when I've taken over the restaurant, then understand all the different problems that he was facing, you know, staff issue and everything else. And next thing, I, I, I realized, you know, when a, a lot of the uh, associations, you know, up and down the country, they're run by quite 
elders, she said. We called them elders, you know. Then when you come to meetings and things like that, and then next thing's like, nothing really changes. Nothing really, want, they don't want change. When I, I propose certain things to people, people are like saying to me, oh, you English guy, you don't know anything. That's what I'm saying. I'm almost 50. I'm still a little bit of a Do you understand? And then, I, my, you know, I'm, I'm very proud Chinese. Yes, I am. And I, I do want to make sure the second generation, third generation, fourth generation will continue with this Chinese heritage. And then, you know, when we talk about the segregation of, of, within the Chinese, you know, yes, of course, there's a way that well, I want to pull them all together in time and hope by being in British that we can pull them together. Great. Th thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and Elisa, you, you, you know, you talked about Manchester being you know, the, the third largest Chinatown in Europe. Um, so it obviously has a significant Chinese population. How, to what extent do, does the Chinese population in, in Manchester feel part of the, the, the a very vibrant um, city? And, um, and also maybe part of the region, you know, so n the Northwest along with Liverpool uh, as the other significant Northwestern city, um, you know, is it, um, do they consider themselves part of the region as well? Yes, we are. I think they, the majority of the uh, Manchester Chinese, we don't call ourselves Manchester Chinese, we call ourselves the Mancunian. So then we are so integrated to the mainstream society and we all love football. <laughs> and we all watch football and then we all go to the pub to dr get drunk together. <laughs> so it is just, um, we are, we, we also, of course, that we will never forget where we come from, um, our ancestor come from. Uh, this is your native. You really can't wipe, uh, wipe out of that. So that's why that we have so many um, Chinese Sunday school in Manchester to teach the generation to speak Chinese. But to teach them to know, learn Chinese, to write Chinese is not because we want them sort of to go to China or we want them to do something in China, but we just want them to know the native the Chinese. So I, f I feel so proud and sometimes I can write something like the choreography and you guys don't understand. So I feel very funny. Sometimes I talk to my husband in Chinese and he, don't understand, he doesn't understand. So then I feel really, really pretty cool. So, <laughs> and, um, but um, the, mm, the society, or I can say the um, Manchester Chinese, that we are very friendly. And we, because I think it's the, because of the city, the, it's so diversity. So you know that we have, uh, it's like uh, very close by gay village, just not far from Chinatown. And then we have um, the, mm, lots of uh, lesbian and then um, different people. We also have a huge population of the Asian. And Manchester is just so diverse compared to the other, maybe the other city. Of course, that we are the second or the third largest, and it depends on uh, how you work the way out. So Birmingham's the second city. Yeah, first, Birmingham so is the second, but we are the, <laughs> the <laughs> second, the second largest of Chinese community. So I think it's because we are very friendly to everyone. Although we do have some tension, but they do feel like a fallen while, and they do feel we love them. We not push them away. So we just need to be a little bit more patient and then hopefully that one day then we all gather together. That's all we hope. Well, peace. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for that really positive note. Um, I, perhaps one, one question uh, before we move on to any comments and uh, discussion points and questions from you in the audience uh, as well as from the online audience. Um, I, I'm aware that there are generational differences, like very significant ones in all the Chinatowns. Um, could you say a little bit about, about those differences? Um, and perhaps also, you know, what, what do the younger generations in these different Chinatowns, what, what are their futures looking like? You know, are, are they hoping, as, as you mentioned, uh, James, in, in rare cases to, in, in fact, continue the kind of restaurant and catering trade? Um, most, as you know, di you know, diversify from those, those the, the trades of their, um, their parents, right? So, so what, what, what is the younger generation of Chinatowns um, look, what, what are their kind of futures going to be, to be like? 
because I'm aware that the 1960s and the, the, the first, that first significant wave of restaurateurs, you know, are now kind of in some ways dying out, aren't they? Yeah. Um, should we go back to you, David? Well, I, it's an interesting question. I can't answer it from a personal point of view because I, I, I don't live in that, in that Chinatown, but I don't think it's a Chinatown. It's not, it's not necessarily a Chinatown thing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a, a national thing of generations. I mean, you're doing well. Yeah, I, I can only know think of my grandchildren now, uh, and, and then they're not, they're not Chinese, my grandchildren. But the fact is that we've done, their, parents, their grandparents have done a certain amount, their parents have done a certain amount, and, and they're, they're, they're reaping the benefits of that. As you said, I don't think they, they want, they should never lose the fact that they have a Chinese culture. I am British born Chinese. I am more British than I am Chinese because I don't speak Chinese, but I'm incredibly proud of the bit of Chinese culture that I can hold on to. I am, and I think, I hope that, I think that will continue through the line. I don't see every one of them wanting to run a restaurant, but they can still, they can still want to see good Chinese restaurants as, as much as anything else. No, they might not necessarily all happen in one place called a Chinatown, but you know, and I, can, I hope they're out there doing many thousands of different things. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you for this wonderful question. This is actually a really big topic often emerged from our oral history interview um, our history, our history interviews. So um, the first thing I want to say is um, Chinese Londoners don't live in Chinatown. So some people Chinese heritage or East Southeast Asian heritage who work in catering industry might be working in London Chinatown. And in terms of uh, older generation, according to some oral history interviews we did, we learned a lot of the older generation, they chose to establish business in the catering industry industry was for survival, purely for survival. And also Chinese catering industry in this country as ethnic niche was created as a negotiation between structure and agency. It was, a lot of research has been done about this area actually. So a lot of, lot of researchers argued actually, um, it was two pieces of immigration policies largely shaped this ethnic niche and the people Lots of these Hong Kong immigrants in the 60s, 50s had no other options in terms of job, career. They were channeled into Chinese catering industry. Of course, there was also a gap in the restaurant market and the, uh, immigrants identified this market and um, established themselves. And what they did was they were trying to work hard and provide for the next generation, make sure the next generation has more options, can work in other professions. And in our Chinatown, this is, you know, this is really echoed in our Chinatown. And we do have a younger generation of restaurant owners in Chinatown. And according to those oral history interviews, we learned a lot of them, they are running restaurants as a hobby, as a passion. And they're trying to, um, in a more confident way, express their culture identity through flavors, through the culinary experience they curated for customers. And I remember one of the interview I did, this restaurant owner, she was telling me she has transnational experience. She grew up in China, but she, studied, but she was born in Ch Southern China, but she grew up in North America and came to the UK to study. She opened the restaurant as a hobby. And she said, I'm never trying to do anything traditional. I'm never trying to do anything authentic. And this is not about what you think my food should be. This is what I want you to eat my food. This is my own way of cook, and they're delicious. So we see this younger generation very confident. They want to reinvent Chinese food. They want to influence the trend. They want to educate. They want to influence. They want to influence the market. No, it's that's very wonderful. exciting. That's yeah. great. That's fantastic. That's a really good um, kind of summary of, of kind of what's what's happening and, and, and yeah. also visually we you, you see that change but it's really good to kind of hear from mm -hmm. kind of I guess the inside as well and to understand those changes that's that's great um, James any, any thoughts yeah, so um, nowadays uh, second and third generation Chinese don't really want to get into the catering trade you could see the amount of uh, Chinese takeaway dying down all across the city because uh, all across the uh, uh, because there's no nobody working because all the uh, parents and grandparents, they all retire. We've got a, a huge skills shortage at the moment, you know, where wages are put up really extremely high. So trying to find skill set at the moment is very, very difficult. So I thought at the mo uh, beginning when, uh, you know, when Hong Kong B&O, uh, there'll be lots of people coming over. No, the first couple of years is, is actually people that, that can speak English. And that, that makes sense. Because like, you know, if you go into another uh, country to live, 
you, if you don't speak English, you're not, I'm not going to you know, pack up a shirt and go over to, to somewhere to try and sell new. So actually, the explosion of growth in Chinatown in Birmingham is through mainland China. So the amount of hot pot restaurants that you must yeah. see everywhere around, that's, you know, it's almost too much hot pot restaurant, yeah. too much of one type of particular cuisine. But when you talk about like Cantonese cuisine, where the British are educated to eat mm. uh, due to relationship with Hong Kong, back in you know, uh, the Hong Kong rule, because they, they, a lot of people don't understand the palate. So we go to different areas like Europe and Holland, you eat Chinese food, it's a little bit different in Germany, it's a little bit different. But Hong Kong food and English, so you get very authentic Cantonese food in England. That's, that's, that's the reason why. Their palate changes towards that size. So the new generation, the second, third generation, I can tell you now, a lot of people don't, don't want, really want to work in this mm -hmm. industry. Uh, whether they're proud or not, are, are, they're not trained in that skill set. They don't want to work that kind of long hours. They want to spend more time with families. So it's like, you know, when I grew up, and a lot of us, grew up with not really seeing their parents so much because you know, my father worked seven days a week and all hours, you know, grew up not really knowing my father. And my mother had to work out occasional times. And so I went to Hong Kong, uh, I, was, I was looked after by my grandparents. And a lot of people were like this. So now, when we grow up, we don't want our children to go through what we've been through and we want them a better way of life. So that's why I think it's a cultural shift. It's that the new generation, as in from the foreign investment, the, the in, immigrants coming in, they're the one that's going to be dominating the scene of Chinese cooking in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank, thanks so much, James. And Lisa, any thoughts from you? Well, I think the older generation, that when they came, they really don't have many choice for their career. Mm -hmm. But now, the younger generation, because of better education and then they can speak the language, so they have a lot more options. They can choose whatever they want to do. So it's difficult to say that whether it's better or it's, it's difficult to say. So you work in a restaurant or whatever, then you work or you work long hours or you work short hours, but it's your choice. But before, probably you don't have any choice because if you don't speak the language and you have no choice but need to work 15 hours a day. But now then you're highly educated and then you can do whatever you like. So I think it's just the same, same, same the um, younger generations in terms of the career-wise is no different from the local people. Yeah, that, and that kind of speaks to that first question about yeah. the extent to which integration has kind of Yeah, so happened. that's why that is, I said that is, if, you, if you're growing up here, you have your friends here, so how can you say that you're not in, integrated to the society? Yeah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> great, thanks so much. Um, so I, if you could join me to thank uh, our speakers tonight. Thank you so much, David and Selma, James and Lisa. Um, it's brilliant, a really wide ranging um, discussion there. Um, I'd just like to open things up to the audience here and online as well. We've got a mic, a roving mic uh, that's coming around. Um, and James, would you mind passing me the iPad where the questions from online audience would be? So I'll. Yes. Um, sure. Should we should we begin with? Um, oh, oh, that was sorry. If I didn't see your hand first. Yes. Uh, do go ahead. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That was really fascinating and great to have the, all the different perspectives. I was just wondering that Britain has a lot of different cultures from all around the world, and many of the other cultures were faced with similar issues, like catering being the big business. We see Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi restaurants. But none of those cultures have branded themselves in the way that the Chinese culture have branded themselves as Chinatowns. Is, is there something about Chinese, however you define it, culture that has led to that? Or was it in a defensive response to the way the Chinese community were treated when they arrived? Thanks so much for that question. Would anyone like to respond? I think you're right. In that sense, I mean, uh, uh, I think I said earlier, the, the one skill that they had when it started off it was feeding each other. They couldn't get the food they wanted. And I think, uh, I read somewhere years ago that they said the big thing about the Chinese populations in, in the West is that they are incredibly sex successful, but they only reach a point where the, the success level gets to the point where they can't go outside of the family. Everything has to be family run. If you suddenly, the next step is to go on to the stock market, they found it very difficult. Now, I'm sure that a generational thing will change, but this was the past. And I think you're right. If you're in a strange place and you, 
and, you, and you've got like Fred and Mary down the road who are doing the supper, something similar. Because it's not only the catering, it's also, it becomes your social life as well. And, you, and ma many of the regional ones didn't speak English or didn't speak it very well, their children did. And, and yet, I, you make a very good point. We don't have India, India towns. Or, I mean, we, ha we have wonderful Curry Row in Manchester. I, I quite often frequented, but, but it's an interesting point. So I think there is that, there's, there's something in that very much. Thank you. I'd like yes, sure. Yeah, thank you there. so much for this wonderful question. Yes, there's, like I agree, there are lots of ethnic minorities in this country also had a similar experience concentrated at the beginning in the catering industry. Why there's a Chinatown but no Indian town? I think we need to look at Chinatown as a brand. Chinatown is really a global brand. This global brand at least has over 100 years history. So the name of Chinatown actually was not given by Chinese people. Um, there are lots of resources say where, where, you know, where was the first Chinatown? Many resources say the first Chinatown was created in the Philippines by uh, Spanish colonists. But uh, there are lots of resources also say different things. But uh, going back to the point is like, uh, I remember when we did the interview with uh, those um, elderly members who involved in the creation of Chinatown in London Chinatown, they were saying, at that time, we, we knew that in New York, in San Francisco, they have Chinatown, they are branded, they have lantern, they have those archway, it's actually brought to the visitors. It worked, it's really good for the local economy, so we wanted the same thing. So they followed the North American Chinatown brand model as a business model. Then they created China in London, localized this brand in London concept. If you look around the world, there's so many Chinatown in many, many countries, even in Singapore. Singapore, over 70% of the population in Singapore are ethnic Chinese, but they also have a Chinatown. Why? Because the government, the tourism department, they kind of um, mm. adopted this idea of Chinatown as a way for cultural heritage representation, uh, pr prison, um, heritage preservation and the tourism economy. So Chinatown in different countries has different meaning. They're geographically uh, very specific. It is a brand. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, such an important point that it's, a, it's, a, it's an economy in and of itself. Yeah. That is self-generating, yeah. self-perpetuating. Exactly. Can I just, just add it a little bit? So of, of course, originally, as a beginning, Chinatown was a product of anti-Chinese racism, cultural marginalization. In North America, Chinese people were segregated. They had to live together. Then Chinatown was created. In that sense, people from outside look into this as a Chinatown. Um, but uh, in, after World War II, many modern Chinatown were created. Then Chinatown, this idea of Chinatown has changed. It's more like a, a multicultural asset, economic asset to the city where it is located. So the meaning of Chinatown is ever-changing. Thank you so much. Um, perhaps um, James and Lisa, you could maybe respond to this question, which is from um, Jennifer. Um, and it, it is interesting because it kind of echoes um, the earlier question. Uh, and Jennifer asks, uh, it seems that lots of Chinatowns share the same aesthetic. Where did this imagery, oh, is this, is this, where, where did this imagery come from? And is this, is it a problem that this is what springs to mind when people think of China? So I suppose it's a question about, you know, that, that point about self-exoticization, does the aesthetics of Chinatown, the gate, um, for example, does it then reduce Chinese people and Chinese culture to cliches? You were talking about the shops that sell, I don't know, the lucky cat, or, which is not even Chinese. <laughs> and, and, you know, the various tourist trappings that you see in, in the Chinatowns, you know, what is, it, does that, kind of perpetuate stereotypes or certain cliches about Chineseness. Um, so, uh, uh, James and... Yeah. I think you should answer this yeah. first. You answer this first. So what exactly is the answer? I, I, guess, <laughs> I, I guess the question is, um, <laughs> Chinatowns have a certain aesthetic. They sell certain things. Mm -hmm. um, not only food, you know, other things that you, you've mentioned in your, your talk. Mm -hmm. um, is, is, it a, is it a problem that Chinatown, you know, continues to kind of depend on those, that iconography, that imagery, that aesthetic? Well, I think that the, the Chinese food is the most cultural stuff then that we think that we should bring to everybody. So the food is so delicious, of course, that China is so big, and then you can't just say, 
uh, Cantonese is better than uh, Sichuan or is better than Shanghai. So obviously we have the Chinatown and then we have varieties of food there. So it is a place that for um, everybody to enjoy is a, a, is a folk point. So if you imagine that the Chinatown for us is like a town hall. So we just go there and then we gather together. So it's not something that we, it is, it is also quite difficult that if you, um, it's like, if you imagine that the Chinatown is like a, um, a commercial business center, or maybe you, you can import a lot of Chinese clothing or all sorts of different kinds of things, but it, it is not the local Chinese people that they do the business. In traditionally because they came here and then they bring their food and then they they, they are all very good chef and is is this is the the business that they're doing passed down with generation and generation so I don't see um, I would not say that in the future that maybe the Chinatown you come to Chinatown you will see more other businesses than in Chinatown or maybe artists because we are thinking that when we generate Manchester Chinatown, we're thinking to open like an open art gallery surrounding the car park. So hopefully then this plan, it will pass by the, um, um, our local council. If they agree with that, then you will see the contemporary art then displayed in Chinatown. Then you see something different. It's not just food. Food is also at art, but in, apart from that, then you will also see other side of contemporary Chinese art. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks oh, so much. I deliberately passed it on to somebody else because Birmingham Chinatown is unique in itself because mm -hmm. we don't have a Chinatown arch. So when the question came, why is all the Chinatown look the same? It's not. Mm -hmm. Birmingham Chinatown is not because there's only a few buildings that's got ter terracotta and the you know, red, green and, and uh, marks. Birmingham Chinatown is very young. Mm -hmm. Birmingham Chinatown is quite modern. Birmingham Chinatown's growing. You know, there's no unique appearance. We've got Pagoda Island. We've got no particular landmark. That's a, and we talked about it, you know, when we talk about the Chinatown Arch Project. Yes, the council come up to me and say, James, when, when we build an arch, they're pushing for the arch more than us. Do you understand? For the point that I rather have different points of interest. Mm -hmm. I point of a different, uh, a different style of maybe a point of interest. I said, I said to people, I said, why do you have to have a Chinatown gate? to say we are Chinatown. But it's the local Chinese that said, we should have a gate. It's the city council, it's no gate. I propose different ideas. Mm -hmm. I can't have different uh, public display of arts, different pagodas, different statues, different whatever it is. Why do we have to stereotype to, to picture ourselves to one particular thing? So all I could say, like Chinatown, everywhere around the world, is we're near theater land. We're near the gay village. We are pretty close to the city center. And this is the one that is everywhere that's exactly, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize if I just said <laughs> so. But uh, what I'm saying is like, uh, we're, we're Birmingham is not the same, but uh, sometimes it's different pressures that push into mm -hmm. us saying, right, okay, we are expected to look like this. Yeah. And then to, uh, I think uh, to the answer uh, question before, when you talk about the different communities coming over, you, you, you still have like, no, Birmingham have the Baldy Triangle, where you have a road of all Asian restaurants and shops and things like that. Every part, you know, Polish have their own Polish, different communities. You've got career town, you know. So you know, people are naturally want to congregate where each, uh, you know, they talk their own language. People want to say, right, okay, come over the country. Well, my father, when he came over in the 60s, 50s, 60s, came over and said, he didn't speak a word of English. Where else could he go? To the dying day, he didn't speak English. But he lived in Chinatown. He lived a full life speaking to local people. That was all his friends around him speaking English set up a successful restaurant, but not speaking English. And a lot of people used to come up to me, how can you do that in England? How could you do that? Oh, you could do it in Chinatown. You could do it in Chinese Quarter. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's I think, a really important, important point about, um, yeah, just the, the diversity, really, and, and the, you know, not, not ceding to the pressure of, of having to be a certain uh, type of person. Um, yes, yeah, so could we take the question from um, yeah, the audience member here? I, I just preface my question by saying that I was born in Hong Kong, grew up in Hong Kong, spent a lot of time in China. I have a mixed racial heritage. I'm Indian. 
and English. Um, and I preface that because there is part of me that wants to explore the notion of how these huge countries, China and India, are suddenly morphed into this small entity. Mm. And I think that is part of colonialism, that basically, and imperialism, that, you know, as an Indian, I'm not just an Indian, I'm a Goan. And I, as a Goan, very different from a Bengali. You know, Hunan Hua is very different from Cantonese. Hunan food is very different from... But actually, people understanding in Britain, they, there is a clear understanding of the difference between Bengalis and different Indian communities than I sense that people have of different Chinese communities. And I find that very, this is 2022, and I find that very bizarre that people still have this entity Chinese. It's much more rich, it's much more diverse, it's much more um, rich, and yet that hardly comes through in terms of what people understand in this country. Sorry. Thanks. Um, I, I do think that that point was kind of addressed in, just in terms of the, the changing landscape of cuisine, right? Yeah. You were talking about the hot pot. That's a very different type of cuisine mm -hmm. from, um, you know, Cantonese food. So people are aware of those differences through, unfortunately, food culture, but I'm not sure that they're much aware of these different cultures beyond the food, you know, so there is there is much to be done in terms of um, diversifying people's knowledge about different Chinese communities. That's one of the things the exhibition really tries to do as well, that the Chinese, you know, um, the diaspora especially come from all over the world, Vietnam, Indonesia, Singapore, yeah. Malaysia, you know, um, and even the Caribbean. <laughs> um, so thanks so much. We've got one I'll tell, I'll yeah. tell you something that's very yeah. interesting. So when I do Chinese Year festivals uh, with uh, uh, to Chinese community and all around, so I'm, I'm, of, so I'm from Hong Kong heritage, so we have a line. We run a line round, you've got to have the symbols and loud noise and everything else. Different much China said to me, we don't have a line. That's not how we celebrate Chinese China, China, China Year. Why do you do that? And they, they, they query me. And I said to him, well, tell me how you celebrate Chinese Year. Well, we don't have the lion, we don't have this. And I was like, okay, fine, you know, <laughs> but, but then after they made that point, we love the lion. They like to see the lion. They want to embrace that culture. So when you've got different people, like students coming up, seeing the lion, they want to take a picture. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, when you contradict me, but you like the culture. Yeah. And they'd want to be that part. So when you talk about different parts of China, mm -hmm. it's the interpretation of Chinese that we have. And, you know, because Britain, rule Hong Kong. So this is why mm. it's, it's predominantly Cantonese. Yeah, that goes back to the point about colonialism as well. Yeah. Um, one very last question from the LKN, which I'd really like to, um, to mention. Um, so thank you so much to Katie via the LKN for this question. Uh, do you think that new Chinatowns will appear in the UK today and where, maybe with the new Hong Kong migrants? So in some ways there's an, like a, a resurgence of of Hong Kong culture with the more recent BNO uh, visa uh, um, of opportunities for, for Hong Kong migrants. Um, any, any thoughts about new Chinatowns in other cities? Scotland? I, so. <laughs> I mean, surely the future will be, I mean, we talk about generation, is that actually you don't, you, you won't need this center which says Chinatown. You take Chinese food out anywhere. And actually, wouldn't it be great if, uh, one of the best Chinese restaurants turns out to be run by non-Chinese, but the, the people who run it really know how to cook Chinese food. Because uh, Chinese food has also gone way into our culture as well, the wok and everything else. It's been, it's, so my personal vision is, I hope that you can you be able to go anywhere in Britain and find a really good Chinese meal, whoever cooks it. Okay, that's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think we might end uh, our event this evening there. Um, 
So. And I'd like to thank all our speakers once again, David Yip, Xiao Ma, James Wong, and Lisa Yum. Thank you so much. Uh, we would love to welcome you back to the British Library for more lectures, conversations, and performances. So do please keep an eye on the What's On pages of our website for more events um, that will support our main exhibition. Um, so once again, Chinese and British runs until the 23rd of April. Please do um, have a look at the exhibition. It's free uh, and encourage your friends and family to come along. There'll also be a series of events all day to celebrate Chinese New Year um, at the end of January. You can also watch past events held at the library on the British Library player. So thanks again to everyone here and thanks again to everyone uh, watching us online. And I hope you have a very good rest of your evening. Thanks so much.